It's time for a change. God offers His people a change that can only be described as spiritual awakening. Join Jackson First Baptist as we discover the path of spiritual awakening. Now, if you haven't already, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. It was the prophet Isaiah speaking on behalf of God. In Isaiah 45 and 22, he said these words, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. Imagine what would happen today if spiritual awakening came in the form of God moving up on men's and women's hearts and they turned to God. Yesterday morning, early on, about 10 minutes to 7, the guys began to grow. We meet once a month as men and call ministry of the brothers. That room was packed. But I left the brothers with this question. I said, tomorrow I'm preaching about intentions. And I want to leave this with you to think about and chew on so some of the men in this room and in the last service are ahead of you and that they had time to think about what I'm going to ask. Here was my question to the brothers. If God opened up the heavens and spent, sent spiritual awakening to you, what would you do with it? You say, what in the world? What kind of question is that? If God from heaven released spiritual awakening, which we have come to understand is this, it's God freshly infusing in the life of the church this power and awakening to do the work of God. So if God chose to send down to you spiritual awakening, let me pose it to you today, what would you do with it? A great preacher of our faith who's still alive today, R.T. Kendall, who used to be at Westminster Chapel, who's now preaching even in our area recently, said this, notice this, the shape answer prayer takes on is determined by our readiness at the time. Think about it this way. Let's suppose that all of a sudden, all that's moving in the world, you and I have been agitated by God. We have said, God, you've announced something's wrong in the world, and particularly in the church, and we have accepted our responsibility. That's the book, The Awakening, that we've written together. And God, we're asking you for anointing. Let's suppose that God is saying, the only thing that's holding it back is this. It is your readiness. What do you want God to do in your life? What is on your prayer list? It was the great pre-reformer, William Tyndall, who was living in a time of great darkness in the world in the early 1600s, or excuse me, 1500s. And he said this to God, God, if you will send me awakening, I want to write an English translation of the Bible. And if you'll give me that translation, God, within a year, even the poorest of the poorest will have their own copy of God's Word. Do you know the church, the Catholic church fought him? The priest and then the high priest himself, the pope himself, had him killed. But he held on even up to his death, and two years to the day of his death, there was the first Bible produced, and within another year, all of the known English-speaking world, if they chose to, could have a copy of God's Word. Let me ask you today, one more time, let me ask you, what would be your intentions if God from heaven came down and answered your prayers today? You say, Pastor, I'm not getting this at all. Well, listen to this. There was the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus. He offered a similar prayer. Look at it on the screen. He said this. He said, Oh God, that you would rend the heaven and you would come down. Now, I know some of you today have no clue what that means. Some of you today are looking at me like you're crazy. I don't, I don't believe in God or I don't want to have anything to do with this. I'm just here today. Well, hold on and just, just, just listen a little bit. For those of you that are praying maybe like Isaiah, God that you would rend the heaven and come down, that the mountains would quake at your presence. Imagine with me what could happen if Jesus' power was released again upon the nation. What could happen if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that if you would receive from God what He wants you to receive. Isaiah understood it because he read his Bible. You know what his Bible taught him? The Old Testament. In Exodus 12, after 400 years, God came down and delivered them from bondage. In Exodus chapter 14, the Bible said this, that God parted the Red Sea at flood stage and the people walked over and the enemies of God's people were destroyed. In Exodus 20, God came down and gave us 10 commandments. God moved and he had seen that and he said, God, I want you to move. Now let me just ask you one more time in case I haven't asked you yet. What are your intentions 
that God would move within your life. If you miss everything else, here's a key moment for us I want you to get. Notice this. Our intentions with God determine His investment with each of us. If you're praying about something and it's never happened, I would say this, check your intentions. If right now you're asking God something and it just doesn't seem to be happening, I would say, God, what's my heart? Maybe God's just leading you to a place of trial. Maybe God's leading you through. Or maybe today it's got that you got the wrong intentions. What are God's intentions for the church? Because I want to tell you this, God has an assignment for every man, woman, and boy, and girl in this room. No matter their age, they, they may be playing on the floor right now. They may be hollering right now, but they're going to grow up and God has an intention for their life. So we might as well right now celebrate them and accept them and not push them to the side and say that we care whatever we have to go through because we want to see that. I want to say that in this room there's some senior adults that the devil has robbed you and you think that it's passed you by. Well, it has not passed you by. What you see is an obstacle, is an opportunity. You see, many of you live your life, and all you ever see is the obstacle. And the obstacles are the things that are in your life, and because of that, your intention is to deal with the obstacles. Some of you know everything about your obstacle. You've researched it online. You've heard all about it. You've heard everybody else tell all about it. You've researched and researched and researched, and when somebody asks you where you are in life, all you tell them about is the obstacle. But others of us have had an opening from heaven, and we've been in God's Word, and we're talking about the opportunity. And so today, I want you to hear this, that God wants to do something, so you're going to choose now. Either you're going to shrink your viewpoint of God and shrink what you do in your life, or you're going to expand your viewpoint of God and let God do exceedingly abundantly above anything you ask, think, or do. So you have a choice. What are your intentions? Now listen, I want to say this to you right up front. Our intention at this church is not that God would send an economic revival. There are those today in the midst of a pandemic who are preaching that God is going to send a prosperity revival. I challenge anybody to show me that in the Word of God. Jesus had nowhere to lay His head. Listen to the New Testament church, listen to me. They never had the resources of the world because they didn't need the resources of the world. You say, preacher, does God want us to starve? No, He does not. God has promised us in His Word. I'm not asking God for a prosperity revival. I already have more than I can manage. You say, so we don't have to tithe. Don't go that far. Don't go crazy. Because God has said He wants us to give. God wants us to prosper. He does. But that is not the focus of awakening to come to give that. So don't be trapped. You say, Pastor, so what should I be? What should be my focus? What should I respond to God? There are four things. They're not in your notes. There are four things you should be asking God to do. Number one is this, to send a harvest. I believe with all my heart if God sends to Jackson First Baptist and He's already seeing the wave of that coming, that God wants us to harvest souls. Everything that we do here is about reaching a lost and dying world. That should be your focus with it, your purpose in your life. Secondly, that listen to this, that you'd build the kingdom of God. We're not about building our own kingdom. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We as a church, everything we do is to harvest, it is to gather, grow, and go. That's building the kingdom of God. You say, preacher, I don't want them kids in the room. You don't count them, but I do. I'm glad they're in the room. I'm glad that they occupy, I'm glad that I am gray-headed today, which tells me this, that I have worked with them, and I've worked with their mamas and their daddies. And that's the reason the kids are hollering in the room. <laughs> because it's my fault. It's my fault. They listen to me. God has ordained that we watch this, that we would reach people, that we would build the kingdom, but now thirdly, that we glorify God. When awakening comes, they're not going to be writing books that says, look what Keith Joseph did. Can I tell you, I'm not worthy to be in this room. We are going to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Right now in the Ukraine, pastors are winning people, church members are winning people to Jesus, and they're not crying out for the Ukrainian church, they're crying out to Jesus. And lastly and finally, I believe this with all my heart, we are to be a people. That we're to be a people that is to complete the mission of God so that Jesus can come. Jesus said, Matthew 24 and 14, when you preach this gospel to all nations, the end will come, I'll return. Uh, did you get up this morning saying this could be the day? I shared with the pastors in a group that I'm part of this morning. I said, preach today as if this was your last day. Do you love his coming? Pastor Chris, I would have to admit I'm, I'm kind of divided. I'm kind of divided. I, I want the Lord to come. 
but my grandson's not saved. I, I, you say, that's the way I am preaching, but I'll tell you another. I like this old world. And God's having to reshape my life and my heart to say, Keith, there are things about this, this life that you're going to have to give up because you cannot expand yourself and receive what I have if you want the things of this world. And some of you are one surrender away from awakening from God. You see, Jesus, in his very first miracle on the earth, his very first miracle he did when he stepped off the page of nothing was he went to a wedding invited. I don't know if he broke it up or was invited. He went to the wedding in John 2. They ran out of, out of wine. You remember the story? And the scripture is that his mama came to him and said, Jesus, listen to me. These people have no wine. Jesus responded, said, woman, what have I to have to do with you? I'm, I'm not here for this purpose. And she didn't even respond to him. She looked over the service and says, do whatever he tells you. So Jesus in his grace and mercy, he took the water that was in the water part, pots and he turned it into wine. You say, preacher, are you one of those ple- people believe in miracles? Look right this way. Look into that camp. Yes! I've seen too many. Kay Pace walked in this morning and should never have been back in the house of God. Should have never been back in the house of God. So don't tell me that God can't heal. And some of you that got your pants on too tight and you can't rejoice, shout, and believe in miracles, it's time that you believe that what God can do. But now watch this. Jesus, after he worked the miracle, left there and some crowds followed him. And John 2 and 24 says this. He committed himself to no one in the crowd because he knew what was in their heart. If all we are about is an awakening so that America would feel better, and the gas prices come down, and that you'd be economically better, and that your household will just be that you could go back doing what you want to do, you in the wrong business. You're wasting your prayer because it won't work. It's got to be God's kingdom agenda. So you say, Pastor, I, I'm not following this. There was a man by the name of John the Baptist who his whole purpose in life was to do the things that we've said, and he said this when he saw Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. The whole purpose of awakening is this thought. You say, Pastor, I want that. I want that with all my heart. I want that with all my heart. So here's the deal. I believe there are three characteristics that God gives us throughout His Word. When when we get in the position that God says your intentions are right, listen to me, if your intentions are right, and I'm telling you today, God has lit up this old world because our intentions have not been right. But today, here it is. Here's what the Bible says. Here's the scene. Say amen if you're there. You've been there a long time. I'm just just happy myself. Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now, I don't know if you get this or not, but I've been to a few baptisms. Other than your salvation, there's no more significant event in your life than being baptized. Can you see Jesus coming off the pages of nothing? And there John the Baptist is. And friend, it's not a fancy baptistry like ours. It is in that old muddy Jordan River. I've baptized people there. It's the worst water in all the world except the Nile River. And the Bible said that John the Baptist was baptizing people in obedience to God, preparing the way, and Jesus comes to that place. I want to ask you today, are you ready to be baptized by God? When we get saved, we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the moment we get saved. In that moment, we've received that from God. But for some of us, we need, we need not a new baptism into the Spirit, but a baptism of surrender. I love the song Zach Williams wrote entitled, There Was Jesus. He said these words, in the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, and in the hurting, like a blessed buried in the broken pieces every minute, every moment. Listen to this. Where I've been, where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. Some of us have been many years in the work of the Lord. You've been faithful. Mama, you are, you are, you are parenting every day. You've changed the diapers every night. You put them to bed. Through the night, you get up. And Dad, you've worked hard. Mom, you've worked hard. You've done all these things. You've been faithful, done everything. And I'm just about to tell you this today. you one step away from there's Jesus. The Bible said that that John the Baptist was baptized in obedience to God, and suddenly, here comes Jesus. Now, I want you to hear this. Three things, three characteristics. One is this, we must be people who obey God. 
Some of you are here today and say, Preacher, I'm hanging on the Word because there's something I'm supposed to do and I don't know what it is. You're, you're thinking ahead of the game. Sometimes you just think two steps ahead. I put together one time a grill without, without having the instructions. I got to way down the line and then I found this little part. And I had to take it all the way back to step number three because it was critical. The most critical step in your life after salvation is your obedience. It's to obediently to step where He wants you to step. The Scripture says here that Jesus came to be baptized. I'm reading now from the King James in verse 14. But John forbade him. Forbade. Is that like a pre-bath? No. John said, no, Lord. No, Lord. Now watch this. I have need to be baptized by thee. Have you ever just felt unworthy to do what you're being called to do? Have you ever just felt like as a parent or as a grandparent, like why did God give me these kids because I'm blowing it? Maybe in your marriage, maybe in your responsibilities, you just kind of feel that you're blowing Now listen to this. Some would say that John got into disobedience, but he did not. There are those in this room that you've lived your life with the obstacle. Jesus has come and said to John, I want you to baptize. He said, no. How many things right now are you not obedient in? Just a simple one. How many of you read the Bible every day this week? More than just a verse, but you read the Bible. That's obedient. How many of you prayed more than two seconds every day? That's obedience. How many of you shared your faith more than once? That's obedience. You say, but wait a minute, Pastor. I thought I was to sacrifice and, and listen to, and do all these other things. For friends. God may call you to that, but the thing He has called you to do is obedience. John said, Lord, Lord, not, no, 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 Lord, Lord, Lord. I don't want to, I, no, Lord, no, no. You baptize me. Now, here's the point. How, now watch this, could the lesser baptize the greater. How could the lesser baptize the greater? You see, some of us have forgotten the beauty of obedience to God. We are obedient because we get to be. We're obedient because He saved us. He's re redeemed us. Not that we have to be. See, John the Baptist was committed to one thing in this moment. I don't want to share center stage with Jesus. You see, if your prayers are not being answered, it could be you're trying to be co-equal with God. It could be that, that your center stage and your life has always been the way it's been because you're the one at center stage. You can't be a good husband because you've got to be first. You can't be a good wife because you've got to be first. You can't be a good parent because you've got to be first. You can't be a good kid because you've got to be first. And you're fighting with other people who have to be first. And the truth of the matter is God, God has not placed any of us in a position of being first. He's put himself in that position. The lesser is called, now watch this, to bless the greater. So whatever He has given you in time, talent, and treasure is your part. And it, it, it might be less than your neighbor's. But it's all less than Him. And whatever He's given us, it is our call for the less to turn around and bless the greater. So whatever the intentions of your heart will be revealed in your action. I mean, our kids are getting tired, right? It's 12 o'clock. So what's going to come out of them? What's coming right down in here? I'm hungry. And so parents have the task to discipline, to obey. And you know you've got to push beyond that. And they're not at that age to do that yet. So sitting there and saying, they ought to be more disciplined than that. They're six months old. <laughs> but how old are you? How old are you? How old are you in your faith? Are you pushing beyond whatever it is you can in obedience to God? And the Bible says here, I love the text, it says here, but Jesus answered and said, let it be so, for thus it fulfills all righteousness. And then the scripture says, then he consented. Literally, in the Greek it means this, he obeyed God. There's just nothing like obeying God. There's joy when you love someone and you make them happy. So if God sends down awakening for heaven and your sickness does not get better 
but God helps you to overcome it, and thousands get saved, will you be the lesser blessing the greater? If he puts you on the shelf and all you can do is carry the preacher's Bible. Mike and Don have carried my Bible, not literally, but might as well have for years. And God has blessed them. And has blessed me. Some of you, what God's calling to you to is beneath you in your mind. It's beneath you. I tell you what, my little mama served the students of her church until she was in her 80s. You know why? Because the lesser has a heart to bless the greater. Watch as Jesus reaches out his hand. I don't know if it's this way. Reaches out his hand that would someday be nail scarred. And John takes him by the hand. The son of God. And leads him to the baptistry. Oh, pastor, if you get the privilege of baptizing somebody, what an honor. We around here, we want the daddies to stand in there with their children when they get baptized. There's a truth there. Jesus goes down there there with John in the the river Jordan. And can you see him going down? That perfect spotless Lamb of God going down. Do you see him there under the waters? I, I was baptized at seven in the north fork of the Kentucky River. It was February. Didn't have a baptistry in our church. Didn't know what such a thing. It was cold. My daddy had just been saved recently. My pastor let my dad get in the water. As I stood there scared to death waiting for my time, they were singing, we shall gather at the river, and I'm not making it up. They were singing, I was scared to death knowing that God had called me to obey him in that moment of obedience. It came my turn. I looked around. My dad was sobbing. My dad wasn't much of a crier. My mom was on the side sobbing. My grandmother, full Pentecostal today, she died, was standing there with her own personal hanky and said, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Celebrating that her son who was lost had come home. The water doesn't save you, but it represents something. There, There the Son of God came up. Do you see it? He came up out of the water. Whether they had long flowing hair, I don't know. The pictures that, that, that we all have see that. I don't think they were around. They had the ability to draw the picture. But there they were. What in the world had Jesus just done? If you have the book that we wrote together, The Awakening, it tells you there in the book, there is the, there's the mode of baptism, there's the meaning and the magnitude. The mode of baptism is not by sprinkling, it is by immersion. You say, preach, that's just them old Baptists. No, listen, do you want a half a picture or a whole picture? See, I want to give the best picture, just like Jesus, by immersion. It says this, now watch, the, here, here is the, the meaning of that. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, here's what Paul wrote. We were buried therefore with him in baptism into death. When a person gets baptized, it is a picture that their old life is dying. As they're going down, hallelujah, it's repentance. They've already repented, but they're telling you in the pew. They're telling them in other parts of the country watching online. They're telling every of their family and friends that have come, I want you to know I am dying to the way that I lived and the way that you knew me. When you get under the water for just a second, we don't leave you there till you croak. But for just a moment, we want you there. It's a picture of your death. You've laid down the old life. 1 John 1 and 7, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from all your sins. The water washing over you, we get you all wet just so that you will be reminded one more time that this has been no more in your life. It has lost its go. And as the dirt moves away from that, you now begin to come out of the water. It is a picture of your resurrection in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has come into your life. You are brand new in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to celebrate. That was Jesus. That was Jesus. Some of you say that ain't the way it was in my church. They took me in there and they talked to me for a minute, put that old white robe on me. They took me in there. They dunked me so fast and went on with the service. Got out. My hair wasn't even dry. I'm sorry if that's how your baptism was. I really am. I'm sorry if you got baptized as an infant and you've held on to that. You've missed something amazing. I'm sorry if you thought that your baptism was what saved you, because it sure did not, because you went in a dry center and came out a wet one. But then there's Jesus. 
When Jesus comes to be Lord of your life, there's some questions we ought to ask each other. Number one is this, have we followed His example? Have you? Have you followed the example of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you had that kind of experience with God? It's not the water, it's your obedience to God. It's your obedience to Almighty God. Secondly, do you understand the magnitude of this? I'm almost done. Please stay with me. And when Jesus was baptized, it said in verse 16, immediately he went up from the water. Who wouldn't? That dirty water. He comes out, wiping his eyes naturally. He begins to come out of the water, and the Scripture says, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. Do you know that a 700-year-old prayer was answered that day? God had rent the heavens And after 700 years of Isaiah's words being repeated over and over in the temple and in synagogue after synagogue by priests and scribes, after all those times looking and praying on this day at a baptism, God opened the heavens. Friend, I'm believing with all my heart that God's going to rend the heavens one more time before Jesus comes. And I believe with all my heart that you are the answer to His prayer. The Bible said that the Spirit of God descended the Holy Spirit as a dove. In the temple in the Old Testament, it was a dove, was a part of the sacrifice. God was saying, I'm going to come and empower this one who has the spirit of liberty upon him. He shall proclaim the gospel to the weak. He shall open the eyes of the blind. The deaf shall hear and the mute shall speak and they shall walk and live. This was the one who was there. A voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. You know what happened? People that obeyed him did the second step. People tell others about him. They just went out and began to tell people about him. Write it down somewhere in your heart. Yeah, after the day of Pentecost, you couldn't shut Peter's mouth up. He began to tell everyone. He said, if I have to die for him, why is it that baptism is your last step of obedience? It was my first step. And I've been stepping ever since in the faith, Michael. That the God I took my stand for has always took his stand for me. And I'm climbing up a mountain, not down a mountain. I'm fighting from a position of victory with God. So you say, Pastor, I'm not getting this at all. Oh, I wish I had another hour with you to tell you, unpack how that when the Spirit came upon him, it changed in that moment what God was going to do. He was a carpenter's son, but now he was the Messiah. He was the man that sat at the earth feet of his earthly father, but now he served at the feet of his heavenly father. He was ready to go. And some of you in this room today, God's wanting to do a work inside of you. And it's not about your ability. It is about your availability. And that if you will obey what he says to you and say, I'll go and tell everybody what you do. I am telling you, you are one moment away. And in that moment, if you'll do this one thing, they were worshiping him. They were not worshiping John the baptizer. They were worshiping him. John the baptizer would say, it's time for me to move to the side and him to move to the front. John the baptizer would move off the scene. This was his last great baptism. The next week he'd meet together, they'd be less. The next week, less. The next week, less. And eventually, there'd be a very few that would stay with him because he was pointing them all to the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, today, I want to tell you that God has called you and I to come out of the lesser of lifting up ourselves and lift up the greater who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do, our kids and children will wake up and say hey something different at home there's something different at the school there's something different on the playground there's something different in the halls of congress because as of yet the world has not seen a spiritual awakened church in my generation but he wants you to see it in yours so I just want to ask you in closing what's your intentions all God wants out of you today is your obedience he will do The rest. Somebody needs to run down this aisle today and say, God's called me to whatever it is and surrender. Some of you today need to come and get on your knees before God and say, God, you know I haven't been obedient in these areas. Or some of you in this room have secret sin. You're trying your best to serve God, but you've never laid down your sin. It's time. It's time that you get right with God. And I'm just telling you today, today's the day that you need to have a living faith to come into that. How does it happen online in this? Here's how it happens. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.
Thank you for taking the time to find God's answers to life's greatest issues. We hope that you would reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions and check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.